sorprendida. Es lunes and we've got a bonus episode for you today because we are celebrating International Women's Day. Yes, you are here. Bienvenida to the Her Dinero Matters podcast, a mixed language podcast hosted by me, Jen Hemphill, to help you become the reign of your money and love your dinero more. If you are needing some inspiration and encouragement at this very moment, you have come to the right place. Gracias por compartir este tiempo conmigo. Now let's jump in to today's dose of money confidence. Hola, this is a Jen Hemphill I know. You're not normally used to hearing me on a Monday, but because it's International Women's Day, I wanted to do the special bonus episode just for you. Before we get to it, I wanted to remind you that if you haven't done so yet, register for Financially Strong Latina. The details are in the show notes. It is absolutely free thanks to our sponsor, AARP. In today's bonus episode, you're going to be meeting two fabulous business owners, Carolina and Daniela, and they're going to be sharing their stories and we're going to have a great discussion. How do I know we are going to? Because we've already done it. Spoiler alert. You know that, right? I cannot wait for you to meet these ladies. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Carolina Campanelli is a Brazilian American art world and museum veteran, business executive and founder and CEO of Nova Bossa, which means new style. And the Nova Bosa is a lifestyle brand where artisanal techniques meet cutting edge designs. Nova Bosa partners with slow fashion, beauty, and home decor brands from the Americas, 90% of which are women owned, to offer a new style rooted in the desire to preserve traditions, champion better lives, and respect the environment. We also have with us today, Daniela Sr., whose love for food and hospitality began at the early age of 13 when she founded a successful catering business from her home in the Dominican Republic. She's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America and a certified sommelier. She has cooked in some of the greatest kitchens in the nation, including Eric Reipert's La Bernardine, and has also led superb restaurant management processes in venues such as Jose Andrada's Saitinia, and served as the regional director for Richard Sandoval Restaurants. Now, lista? Vamos a conocer a Carolina and Daniela. Welcome, welcome, bienvenidas, Daniela and Carolina. I'm so thrilled to have you here on the podcast and to celebrate with you International Women's Day that is happening today. And I wanted to start with getting to know each of you a little better. And uh, you all both are phenomenal business owners. And let's start with uh, you, Carolina. Please tell us a little bit more about your background and your biggest money memory. So we're just going to go back in time and learn about you. And then we're going to learn more about your business. Well, Jen, gracias for having me here in this podcast. It's really an honor. I was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is this amazing, amazing, chaotic place. It's like New York City times 10. I think right now they have about 23 million people in the city. So it was a very exciting time. We always had amazing things to do. From the very beginning, I was very much in love with the ethnic diversity of my city and, and of the of Brazil in general, how warm people were, how happy they were, the beauty, the environmental beauty of the place, but also very keenly aware of the social inequality. So Brazil, as any other country in Latin America, perhaps even at a, a higher degree, is very unequal. And it was very easy to see from very early on, you know, that some people had a lot and some people had very little. On my way to school every day, I would see slums in between some more affluent neighborhoods. I would be able to sometimes peek inside and see these very tiny houses, no trash pickup, no electricity. And, and then I would go to an elite school. So it was very glaring for me. And it was really hard to wrap my head around that. 
you know, I remember kind of first many memories that we didn't have a lot. My parents were very, very young when they had us. My dad was 19 and they had an unplanned pregnancy and had twins. So he was still in college. And I remember, you know, for the first year, he was only with us on the weekends because he was in another city. But after he got his job, he had to manage a family and, you know, four mouths to feed on an entry level salary. So he was teaching at night while having a full time job. So we were most of the time with my mother. And I just remember her having to answer to my dad for everything that she spent, not having a lot of freedom. And from a very early on, I was a very independent girl that wanted a lot of freedom. I thought, I am not going to be like this. My number one thing is to be independent and to be have freedom to spend on. I will never be answering to a man as to what I'm spending. So that was kind of an early on life, you know, that I wanted to be free and I wanted to be financially independent. Fortunately, my parents always spent a lot of money in school, kind of the investment that they made on us was in school. So we went to very good private schools. And I remember my dad saying that our first tuition was like 60% of his salary, (laughs) which is crazy. But we were, you know, kind of in this world with, even though we didn't have a lot, we had friends that had a lot. And it was a little bit difficult because I didn't have the clothing that they had. I didn't have the material possessions that they had, the beach house and the ranch on the weekends that I could go to. But I had access to that through my friends. And I never thought that when I grew up, I would not be as affluent as they were. For some reason, I had that ambition and I had that knowledge, I guess, because I did go to these schools that I was going to be like them. And so I worked my way really hard to achieve that. We came to the U.S. when I was 13, and it was very hard for me. But about a year and a half later, I got my first job at a Harvard trading company, which was a little tiny clothing store near a high school. And it was this brilliant business model because the owner would get the cute girls from high school to work there and then would take pictures of us to model in the store. So we were, you know, popular because we modeled the store. And then we would drop all of our salaries at the store to model these clothes for free for him at the high school. So I never took any paycheck home, very little, but I had my own clothing for the first time. And I remembered that this was it. I mean, I was just so excited to earn my own money and not have to ask my dad for anything when it came to clothes. And so I started working from 15 on, not so much during the school year, but in the summer and pay for all these trips to Europe with my friends and everything that I wanted to do, all my clothing, et cetera. So I was hooked on this financial independence. Just to wrap up, I then went to school. I studied international affairs. I wanted to be a diplomat for Brazil, but I started working in a think tank here and I realized I didn't want to be a diplomat, but I still wanted to do something to promote my country. So I went into kind of cultural diplomacy and preservation of cultural heritage and work with that for 10 years in places like the Smithsonian. Then I went to the private sector and headed uh, B2B sales for all of Latin America for Rosetta Stone, which is a language company. And I married those two passions, the cultural diplomacy side with the Latin America and business to create Nova Bossa, which is a lifestyle brand and store where we focus and invest in women-owned brands from Latin America and bringing beautiful lifestyle products to the to Washington, D.C. Well, it's a fascinating story, uh, Carolina, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about your business and a little bit, so thanks for sharing that. Now, Daniela, let's go back in time to your biggest money memories, your background, so whether it was your little girl, a teenager, take us back. Yeah, sure. Again, hola, and again, thank you so much for having me here today. Very, very excited to be celebrating International Women's Day with you all. So, I don't know, I guess my biggest money memory starts at a very young age. I think when I was like in second grade, when I think that's when I started my first business. And I started selling with my friends stickers at lunch in school. I think from a very young age, I've always had a very entrepreneurial spirit. And like Carolina, actually, our upbringings are very similar in the fact that my parents believed the same thing in putting us in the best schools, but that meant like elite private schools in Dominican Republic with people that were a lot more affluent than I was. And it's a blessing and a curse in the sense that at a young age, you don't understand why some people have a lot more than you and why you have less. And I think that really created for me a desire to make it. 
it was like, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes in life to really have all that I want to have. And not necessarily, obviously, yes, always dinero matters, you know, 100%. But also it was just a sense of not having to worry about anything. It was more like, it doesn't buy you happiness, but it buys you a lot of nice things. My first like official business, I started when I was 13 years old and it was called Bake Specially for You and it was a dessert catering company. And I started it by asking my mother for $200 and she was used to at that time already me having all my little ventures and she's like, oh, Daniela, what is this for now? I'm like, I promise you, I'm going to pay you back when I have let you down. I haven't. So she's like, okay. And I ordered all these boxes and did my own brochure and little stickers and basically did like about 120 petit four boxes of these mini desserts and had this little brochure and started giving it out to anyone that I knew. My neighbors, my mom worked at a bank, so I went to the bank and gave it to all her coworkers, my friend's parents, like you name it. Literally, I had like 120 boxes to give out. The next day, calls started and I had a business that I had until I basically graduated high school and was able to allow me to pay for part of my tuition or actually most of my tuition to go to CIA in New York. And that was like my first moment of freedom because I don't think at the time my parents would have necessarily been able to afford my full college tuition as an international student in New York. Mm. Yeah, I think that was the first step. And I think the first moment for me, I saved a lot from 13 to 18 to be able to make that happen and definitely allows me to value hard work a lot. And both of my parents are super hard workers. Successful in their own regards is not super wealthy, but, you know, but very successful as well. But I don't know, they definitely taught me the value of money and where to spend it. And I don't know, it just really generated this hunger within me to just do great things. And I think it's kind of created at a young age. Yeah. Such a beautiful story. Daniela. Now let's get, I know, Carolina, you've hinted and you shared a little bit about your business in terms of the experience that you had and how you've merged those things together. So if you could tell us a little bit more about that, because I'm curious to know, how did that come to me? Is it because maybe you just had different interests and you were always looking to see how to merge things together? Or did it just by accident happen? I'm just curious to know how that came to be. And what led you to start your business? I was always entrepreneurial. As Daniela said, and it just reminded me when I was five, I also had my little business, which is we lived in a very like a fortress building. And I had a little I would sell coffee to the construction workers. And I would hand them the coffee through the bars of my building and they were like 50 cents, which was super expensive. And and then I would sell earrings with people that were coming out of the elevator so they couldn't like avoid me. But I always knew I was going to do business, but I also wanted to be a diplomat for my country because when I came here, I felt that there there was a lot of misinformation about Brazil and people really didn't understand where I came from. So I kind of chose the path of at first to go to diplomacy and study international relations and get into fundraising, which was amazing. And somehow I kind of went more towards the cultural heritage and raising money for that and the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art, which is the largest repository on the history of American art and design and really love that. But it got to a point where I felt, okay, My passion in life is to, I wanted to be successful to make a difference in my country, more of a social distance, going back to that social inequality thing that I was talking about. So I felt like I was indulging myself a little bit too much by being so much so focused in art, in the arts. So I went to the private sector because at that point I had experience in nonprofits and the public sector working in the Smithsonian. So I said, I need to become an entrepreneur, I need to understand business. And there, I mean, it was amazing. I went as a fundraiser, you're very successful. So I was heading sales and I just used my fundraising skills and I was bringing these large deals and they couldn't believe like how resourceful I was, but I was making a difference in Latin America because the company I chose to go to was teaching languages, right? And in Brazil, the biggest 
equalizer is if you speak English. So if you are born in the elite, you're always going to have a good English, you're going to learn, but other people don't have that ability. So I wanted to make that an equalizer and democratize language learning in Brazil. And I know for a fact that my work was, for example, allowing full 100,000 Brazilians to learn English. So that was on more of a social thing. But when I had my child, and after spending five years traveling almost weekly to Brazil and Latin America, I said, okay, I'm gonna, now I'm going to quit and take some time to myself, and then I'm going to start my business. And there was this one thing that was a turning point. In 2013, I asked my boss at the time to pay for a course at Harvard called Women in Power, Leadership in a New Era. And I told her, you know, this is going to teach me how to become a woman leader. And I remember going to this, it was just a one week course and learning how hard it was for women to be leaders, for women to be in state CEOs, for women to start businesses. I mean, shocking. Like I believe at that time, that year, $1.9 billion had gone to male founders from venture capital and like 200 million to female founders. So I said, okay, a couple of things. First of all, this is completely unfair. Where are the women investing in other women, right? And also I'm going to have to be self-made. So fortunately, with the money that I had made at 32 it was my biggest earning year. And I'm, you know, 10 years later, it's going to take me a while to earn what because it was so easy, right? In the corporate world, sales and commissions. And so I think I didn't value money as much as now that I'm a business owner. But I said, let me marry the three things that I'm passionate about: preservation of cultural heritage, Latin America and sustainability and women. And so I founded a company that invests in women-owned brands from Latin America. So 90% of the brands that we invest in are women-owned brands from Latin America. And they themselves employ hundreds of female artisans throughout Latin America to make these beautiful, sustainable luxury products that we're selling here in the lifestyle category. So clothing, accessories, beauty, home decor. And I felt it was my way because I'm not an heir. I have to create wealth, but I don't have that wealth right now to invest and do create a foundation, for example. It was my way from the get-go, start making a difference. And I believe we are. You know, the circular economy that we invest in is a couple thousand women. They've been severely impacted now by COVID, of course, but we have been able to stay afloat because of the fact that I'm self-funded and because of the fact that I was able to stop paying myself and put more money into the business. So that gave me the freedom. But if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't still be here because we opened the store and the business just six months before the pandemic. So it was a way to marry that. But ultimately, what we want to be is a larger lifestyle brand that will also go into the hospitality and boutique hotel field, but to create a foundation that's going to really be investing in a much larger scale in women and children in Latin America. You both are so fascinating. And for you listening, I'll be sure to link up the Instagram link so you can follow both of Daniela and Carolina because it's amazing what you all have accomplished. Now, Daniela, let's turn to you. I want to know more about Serenata Sumo. Obviously, you've shared that you've been an entrepreneur since you were a little girl and that hasn't stopped. I think you're more of like a serial entrepreneur, maybe with multiple businesses. So what led you to start your business? Sure. I think, again, it was always my dream and uh, achieving that independence. My career really started in the back of the house. So within hospitality, I've pretty much done it all really from cooking, to serving, to bartending, managing for different companies, including Jose Andres Think Food Group, the Four Seasons. So different varied types of businesses. And I learned a lot from all of them. You know, I think I made it my mission to take each job that I had and say, okay, what's ultimately what I'm going to get out of it? I'm putting a lot into it. I worked in some of them 16 to 18 Mm. hours a day, six days a week as hospitality, as we all know, is very, very demanding. So I put my heart and soul into them. But I also was very smart to know that it wasn't just a job for me. It was very much with intent. What am I also getting from the jobs that I'm working? What am I learning? And that always kept me from, I guess, deviating and am I going getting tired? Because, you know, it can become very monotonous day in and day out. But it's just like, I kept shifting and working with my managers, okay, I want to learn this, and I want to learn the financial part. And even at times, taking over my 
boss's job that I wasn't getting paid for, but I was like, no, I'll do it just because I wanted to really understand the financials in depth and how do you make this profit and loss statement shine and where the money's coming from. And even at one point, taking a job that even though I have so much love for food and beverage, that wasn't my favorite food and beverage place, but ultimately knowing very well that I wanted to know why they were one of the most profitable hospitality groups in the US. And I took that job with that intention of understanding that because again, ultimately, I have such love for food and beverage and how I started my businesses with my first business in the US was Colada Shop. And my intention really there, which is a Cuban cafe and Colada, meaning a Cuban coffee meant to be shared and really wanted to create a whole different Latin vibe and environment where people could relax, could get our products and not really feel like they're in a hole in the wall. I very intentionally wanted to create a space that made people feel very comfortable. That was very much the place where people wanted to take pictures at, that was the cool place to be because I also saw that as an opportunity to really share Latin culture and showcase the beauty that we really have to offer and present it in a different way of like, oh yeah, let's go to this neighborhood. And that not that there's anything absolutely wrong with the amazing food you find in more like hole in the wall locations, but it's not necessarily elevating our culture and putting it in the same place that where it deserves to be. That has always been my intention is kind of changing that stigma and doing that also by supporting women our staff is compromised of primarily like about 90% women, a lot of them single mothers. And I honestly love them, A, because I give them an opportunity to sustain their families, but also they're really a lot more responsible. You know, they have someone to take care of. So it's kind of, to me, a win-win. It's like people, well, they have all these responsibilities. I'm like, yeah, and it's not party. Mm. You know, like they really need that money. They need that dinero to go take back to their families. And I like the relationship and the dynamic that that creates. And, you know, I have multiple locations of Colada Shop and we plan to keep expanding that and again with that mission in mind of really just sharing our culture and even though we're primarily Cuban with that location we are really representing all of Latin America with our vibrancy great food and ultimately music and just Cuban hospitality how I call it Cuban <laughs> then you know we have Serenata and Sumo which is a dual concept de la cosecha market which is very much passion uh, project in the sense that I really got into this industry cooking, but really for the biggest part of my career focused on beverages and cocktails and introducing Latin and Spanish spirits into the country as well. And again, showcasing the beauty inside those bottles and Serenata and Sumo allow me to do that through beverages and very different things. So Sumo is a daytime concept, really focusing on the fruits and juices and smoothies of Latin America, while Serenata is really a Latin cocktail bar using a lot of those same ingredients, but also with the introduction of spirits and bringing that vibrancy of those fruits and textures and colors that are not necessarily always displayed in the most proper way, I would say, when used and, you know, with people that are not as familiar with those ingredients. And also with a focus on bringing ingredients and working with our distributors and suppliers on sourcing items that wouldn't have ultimately been here already. So like Acerola Cherry from Dominican Republic, Amazonian Gin from Peru, things that we've sourced that we are the only ones that have because want those flavors and want to make sure that we are committed to authenticity in what we're putting forward. I love it. And you mentioned La Cosecha Market, which is a place that I'm so fascinated with, which we haven't even touched. And I meant I should have probably just touched on La Cosecha from the beginning because that's how we are together. I'm just curious to know, because as I mentioned, I'm very fascinated with the concept, what La Cosecha Market is doing. How did you connect and decide I definitely have to be here with La Cosecha? I'm curious. Do you want to take this on, Carolina? Sure. I 
was testing the concept of my business by doing some pop-ups. And I have a friend, her name is Pilar Larry, who used to be at the Smithsonian Latino Center when I was at the Smithsonian Associates. And she mentioned to me that there was an opportunity, this Latin market that was going to be built by Edens, which also owns Union Market. And if I was interested, and I thought, you know, I hadn't thought about having a store yet. I don't know if I'm ready, but I did a pop-up test at Union Market over a weekend. And it was great because we are, it's, we're in the luxury category. And I don't know that we are the right fit for a food market. And I think they had like the largest ticket prices um, that they had had at Union Market, but we still without any marketing sold. So I was hooked and I, we were one of the first ones to actually, I think the first business to sign on to La Cosecha. I'm very inspired by Daniela. Daniela is my neighbor there at La Cosecha. So we're just across from each other. And she's a serial entrepreneur. I'm a first time entrepreneur and she's so young and has all these businesses, but it's such, I'm equally inspired by all of the owners there. So it's a contemporary marketplace and culinary embassy celebrating centuries of Latin American heritage. Each business owner, there are 17 businesses is from a different country in Latin America. There are two retail stores, Nova Bossa being one, and then a lot of food concepts from street food to high-end cocktails like Serenata, as she mentioned, to El Cielo, which by a restaurant tour that even has a Michelin star. So it's a w- wonderful place pre-pandemic when we had just opened. It had even salsa classes on the weekends and DJs on Friday and Saturday night closing at 1 a.m. And we know it's going to come back to that. But it's also a place for embassies to have events. So it's really, really an exciting place. It's a place full of energy. The music is blasting. It's just amazing to be there. I agree. Like I said, I've been fascinated because it does encompass culture, community, the energy of the Latino culture, as well as supporting business owners, Latino entrepreneurs, which I absolutely love. If I can add one thing there, which is so exciting, one of the reasons we wanted to go to there was here is this large American company, very large company making a huge investment in creating a high-end Latin market, which is the first of its kind in the world that we know of, in the middle of a political environment where Latinos were being vilified. And so I said, that's it, because our company, we are kind of a, you know, a social brand and an activist brand. And I wanted to make that statement. We are investing, we are proud of our Latino heritage, and we are barely two miles from the White House, and we're going to do this. So it was really very brave of them to do that because the Latino population is one of the largest growing in the U.S., but there was no real sophisticated representation of what we do. So it's a very exciting place, and it has been really, truly embraced by the entire neighborhood. Yes, and you mentioned the White House because I didn't mention La Cosecha for you listening is in Washington, D.C. So for those that are in Washington, D.C. and don't know about it, check it out and visit Daniela and Carolina, their businesses. Now, Daniela, tell us about your connection to La Cosecha and what made you decide I am going to be at La Cosecha? Absolutely. I am very inspired by Jody McLean, who is the CEO of Edens, and she's a big supporter of women and had connected with her through the James Beard Foundation and a program. And honestly, she told me about her goal and her vision of La Cosecha. And like Carolina said, it was like all basically this amazing market that was being highlighted in a very high end way, right? It was taking away all the stigmas. It was supporting small businesses. It was supporting women entrepreneur. They were supporting just first time business owners. So I felt very, very drawn as well as La Cosecha Foundation. La Cosecha Foundation is basically part of our proceeds go into this foundation that goes back into Latin America. And that is also something that's very important to me as an entrepreneur. And how do we support? Sometimes it gets a little bit hard being here. How do we connect to the right person back in Latin America, make sure that the funds that we're donating actually get into the right hands and help other people become more successful? So yeah, I think that really created 
a beautiful, not only illusion, but initially I would say, I'm like, I have to be here. You know, the bar is center of La Cosecha that, you know, where the party starts and then everyone goes around. <laughs> and yeah, and also the opportunity to be part of this beautiful community of entrepreneurs that, you know, I love including Carolina. It's just so many people in there. It's so amazing to connect with them, share ideas. And it's like, you know, work together. We meet on a weekly basis and kind of plan the programming. So it's really a beautiful space to be a part of. For me, when I saw and uh, found out about La Cosecha, that foundation that you mentioned was like, that blew me away. I'm like, this is absolutely beautiful. Of course, I like the other things. But I think for me, that's what caught my attention. And that's when I started paying attention more on everything that was happening with La Cosecha. Now, I want to wrap it up. I do have a few more questions because it is International Women's Day. And International Women's Day is meant to acknowledge women's rights. So I'm curious to know from your experience, and we'll start with you, Daniela, this time, what are some challenges business owners face that needs some attention and focus? Absolutely. I would say access to funding, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's, a known fact that there's a big inequality of the access to funding that's been given to women. And then you add on top of that minority business women, right? So that's even definitely moves the scale a lot further. It's just, it's incredibly hard when you're as a first time business owner to get funding. And even not as a first time business owner, you have to do a lot more work than our male counterparts to really get into that room, get people to listen and be having the facts be treated as equal, just as a matter of gender. So I think that is definitely something that still needs a lot of work. I also think that we have to work also as women supporting women. It is in matters of access to funding and really push each other forward because it is, you know, very challenging. And ultimately, without dinero, nothing happens, you know, and it's that's the reality. We can, you know, we can have all the great intentions in the world, but if we can't get access to that money to really start and open those doors, it's really, really challenging. And I admire people like Carolina that have put everything into their business and are self-funded, but that's not always able to be the case. And depending on the amount of capital that you need, support is needed. And yeah, I think there are, you know, angel investors out there that should really target and refocus their energy into finding more women to support and, you know, really see things a little bit differently. I also think there are beautiful programs like Empowered Women International that I mentor for at times that focus on women entrepreneurs. And, you know, my work there is I get usually two mentees per season and work with them in developing their business plans and making the numbers work. And, you know, actually, so I think programs like those are also incredibly important to make it more transparent as to how to get funding and also opening the doors through those programs to, you know, organizations like Latino Economic Development and things like that, that actually put some of their focus on helping first time entrepreneurs. I love Empower Women's International. I had the opportunity to teach one of their workshops, Just Focus, of course, on personal finance. And I was blown away by everything that they teach because I was thinking, I could have used this, (laughs) the phenomenal program. Now, Carolina, how about you in terms of what do you feel are some of the challenges and needs? Completely agree with with the Daniela. It's always the same. For me, it's three. And that's something that I've learned over my career. It's access to funding, access to mentors, access to networks. That really is a big difference. And I knew that I would have to be self-funded to start this. And I had a lot of naysayers at the beginning too that thought that this was just something that I was doing on the side. But I am trying to provide the conditions for other women to have mentors access and and funding and through Nova Balsa and, and other organizations as well. I think mentors are really, really important. And I go after mentors and, and I know they're busy, but it's just so hard. It's so important to have access to people that can help you make executive level decisions. And we don't have a lot of them. So it's important to, to throughout your career, stay in touch with people that have mentored you or that you admire because you'll need their advice at some point. But it's shocking that 
venture capital is still not heavily invested in women. It's proven that when women founded businesses do very well, when they have the capital companies with women in boards and women CEOs do better than, and then companies without women in boards. And so it's just, it's about time. And so we need to take matters into our own hands. There are a few funds that we are starting to see Elvest, the Tory Burch foundation that are giving money to women that are investing. We did get a small grant, which was really nice and symbolic from the Spanx foundation just now with the pandemic. Sarah Blakely gave to a thousand women entrepreneurs, but these are still small. At some point, if we wanted to really scale, we're going to need investors. But I want to show that we can grow organically before we do that. Our mission is to preserve traditions, champion better lives, and respect the environment. And in the champion better lives, we are focused on investing in women in Latin America. And the conditions that they work in are very different. A lot of times, these artisans they have to stay at home, they have children, they have families. And so if you don't provide them the ability to work from home, they are not going to be able to work. So we are very responsive to that need and making sure that these women, most of the time are working from their homes and providing these products so that they can earn an income and have some equality. Because if you depend on your husband or your father, you know, for money, you are never going to be truly equal. You're never going to be truly independent. You're never going to be able to flee violence, for example. And so it's part of our mission. It's very much what we want to do. But I encourage everyone listening, mentor women, hire women, teach them. I teach women that work for me, how to negotiate against me, because that's one of the things that I've seen. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't ask for what they need. It's amazing to see that. But, you know, it's really invested in women because the payout, I mean, it's amazing. As Daniela said, you know, we have to take matter into our own hands. We have to ourselves become mentors. I am part of a few organizations also that mentor women, Gender Alliance of the BMW Foundation and some others. But, you know, we are training on the job. We are heavily invested. And I hope that all of our sisters will do the same. Instead of competing with other women, let's lift each other up, you know? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. And one thing, one point that I wanted to make in my own experience, when you mentioned about mentors, I have found the challenge, and I think this has evolved over time, but when I started is finding the mentor that not only understands your niche, but understands the business model, because there's the different business models, and some understand the business model, but they don't understand the niche, and then vice versa. And so that, for me, has made it more challenging, but just a side note, and I don't know if you've experienced that. Now, let's wrap it up with the last question is... In continuing the celebration, I have absolutely loved this conversation, by the way. Who is a woman that has impacted you the most and why? Daniela, let's start with you. Well, I will have to say my mother. <laughs> as much as sometimes, like, I can't believe how similar we are, even though, you know, sometimes we fight like every mother-daughter, right? But she has, from a very young age, impacted me significantly and showing me how hard work pays off and determination and I really think seeing that as a model day in and day out growing up really gave me those values and gave me the courage to not allow men to tell me no, which I've been told and I just don't take it. I'm like, okay, see you later. You know, I don't think so. I think just seeing how powerful she is and just dynamic and having gone for what she wanted in life really had a huge impact on me. Love it. And Carolina, how about you? So I have a few, but I am also my mother because she had to give a lot when she got pregnant, right? So she was starting college and she had to quit. She lived for a large part of my life, dependent on my dad. And so she always instilled in me this belief that I would be independent, that I would go to college, that I would be successful, that I wouldn't have to answer to anybody for what I spent. And, and my parents never treated my brother and I differently. They taught us ambition equally. They always told me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. And that came true. So that's number one. But also the examples of my grandmothers, and I didn't have a lot. First of all, my maternal grandmother, I never met. She had died before I was born. And my paternal grandmother, I had very little access to. But my understanding of their lives is that they had very, very difficult lives and difficult marriages and marriages that had abuse. And they weren't able to leave those marriages and get out of that life because they were not financially independent. And that to me was a huge lesson because I never wanted to be in a situation where I was in danger or I had my kids and I couldn't leave someone 
because I was financially dependent. So for me, that's part of my goal in life to provide economic empowerment for women so that they can stay in their marriages or they can leave their marriages, whatever they want to do. But it's their choice that you're not dependent on someone else that you can leave your life the way you want to. And so I think that those cautionary tales that I had from my own family uh, is what has fueled me and provided me this wish and this desire to be financially independent and have freedom. Beautiful. Well, Daniela, Carolina, this has been such a fabulous conversation. I really appreciate both of you. You are an inspiration. Keep doing what you're doing. You are setting just the pathway for other Latinas, Latinas that are listening that maybe want to go into entrepreneurship that are able to connect with your stories and say, oh my goodness, I've been thinking of this, but I don't know if it's been possible. But you ladies have proven that it is possible. So thank you so much for celebrating International Women's Day with me today. And I hope we definitely, when this pandemic, because I want to meet you in person. So hopefully we can make that happen. Thank you so much, Jen, for the opportunity. Oh, I appreciate you both. Muchas gracias. This was such a fun conversation, and espero que les gustó esta conversación con Carolina y Daniela. I really want to thank La Cosecha Market here in Washington, D.C., as they were the ones that connected me with these fabulous ladies. Make sure you connect with them or their businesses, I should say. All their information is in today's show notes, but let me give you their Instagram handles real quick, just in case, since you're listening to this and you're listening to this on a phone most likely you can go ahead and open up your Instagram and follow Nova Bosa Living, living just with an N at the end, no G at the end. And Daniela for her businesses, Serenata DC, Sumo with a Z, Sumo DC and Colada Shop. All of that are their Instagram handles. And again, I'll have the rest of their all their links in today's show notes. I also want to remind you, as I did earlier, but I get distracted easily. If you have not registered for Financially Strong Latina, get your seat. They are free thanks to our sponsor, AARP. You can grab those at financiallystronglatina.com. And please, please share, share, share. (laughs) Like I always say on this podcast, you just never know when someone is dealing with a challenging financial time and sharing this event could be exactly what they need. Now, there's three ways to give more visibility to the event. If you're as excited as I am, I would absolutely accept your help. You can share the registration link with your mama, tia, hermana, prima, colegas, amigas. You can also go to the Facebook event page. The link is in the show notes, but you can simply search Financially Strong Latina on Facebook, select going, and by doing this, Facebook shares this with your friends, because as soon as you select going, your mama or your tia, they're going to see, oh, she's going to this event. So please, please do that. That would really be helpful. Also share that you're going on social and use the hashtags one or all. I'm not picky. Financially strong, financially strong Latina or Fuerza Financiera. Feel free to tag me and I will be sure to reshare the post. That is it. Thank you for joining me on this bonus episode in celebration of International Women's Day. You can check out the show notes over at jenhemphill.com forward slash IWD for International Women's Day. So that's jenhemphill.com forward slash IWD. Remember that being a reign of your money starts now simply by claiming it. And I believe in you. And of course, so should you. So if you love this podcast and you love this episode, I would love it if you share it with someone you care about. And that is it for me. I will see you in a few days because guess what? It's Monday and uh, we will be back on Thursday. Muchas gracias. Ciao.